Well, again, welcome. I'd like to briefly introduce Dr. Jason Ellis, who's here today from the Department of Communications and Agricultural Education. It's my first time meeting Jason, but looking forward to his presentation today on making papers and presentations scientific. A great topic and a great time because final reports aren't due next week, right? So uh, hopefully some good information that we can keep in mind as we're ramping up uh, towards the end of the semester and it's kind of all university presentation that we get to make. So Dr. Ellis. Thank you. Well, first off, since you have reports due next week, <laughs> tell me what's this report supposed to include? What's its form? What's its structure? Do you have a clue yet? What's supposed to have you started working on it yet? No. We have a poster. You have a poster? Eventually. Next week? Eventually, no. Right, and I'm coming back later in November to talk about posters. Sweet. So let's cover the report for what's supposed to go in your report? Sections, inf what types of information? That's why I'm here. So you don't have any type of a guideline yet as to what this report's supposed to consist of? We basically read articles and then we kind of create a paper that goes along with articles that we've read in the groups. So it's one like, it's like, I know in our group there's like five of us, so we all write each like our own part and then we combine it together with, to make one big paper. Okay, so a literature review is what I'm taking from this. It's, so not a report of your outcomes, but more of a report of what you're finding in the literature that you're reading to do your annotated bibliographies that are due tomorrow. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so good. I'm just trying to orient myself here, make sure I know where you guys are coming from, what your expectations are. I know we talked a little bit about what you want, but I want to make sure I'm going to address your needs. So my, my topic for today is making papers and presentations scientific. Let's see if I can run this remote. Oops, wrong button. There we go. So I want to orient us a little bit first though of, of what is science? Because in order to make a paper or make a presentation or something along a report along those lines, to make it scientific, what does it mean to be scientific? Well, to be scientific is probably gonna include some science, right? And so you guys are in the NRES program. So what is that, that science all about? Well, really how I orient ourselves, in, and I teach a class, uh, a graduate level class called Scientific Communications, and we start off the semester discussing what is scientific communications, because it's different than science communications. And so our goal today is to get you a little more oriented into the, the realm of scientific communications, or how, as scientists who study natural resources and the environment, in RE, how as scientists in that field, how do you communicate as a scientist? But also, how do you communicate about the science of NRES? So we look at the definition here, and, and I don't expect you to memorize this, but there's a couple things I want you to pull out of this. So it's really a concerted human effort to understand or to at least understand better the history of the natural world and how the natural world works with the second component being using observational evidence as the basis of that understanding. So really, we've all seen and we've all worked with the scientific method. Um, oops, let me back up a little bit. We've all worked with the scientific method. You all know the scientific method, right? You know how to do science. So you, you have a problem, you develop some question or an objective or a hypothesis that based on the situation, this is what I think is going to happen. And so then I'm going to create a method in which I'm going to test that hypothesis. So you think, okay, so if I throw the apple in the air, is the apple going to stay or is the apple going to fall? Well, my hypothesis is that the apple is going to fall. So how might I test that hypothesis? I don't know, throw the apple in the air. So that is our experiment. We're doing something. And then our observation of what happens when we do that is how we collect the data. And the data is the information that comes from this process. And so when we throw the apple in the air, we watch the apple. And we see that the apple goes up, the apple comes down. That's our data. Our data is the pure facts of that experiment. When it goes up, it comes down. Pretty simple. So then the resulting part is we draw conclusions based on that data. 
So our conclusions would be our interpretation of that information based on what we know about the bigger field of the science. So we're all going to be doing some form of a research project or a, a project in here. And research can be this literature review paper that you all are working on. You are creating some form of a question of, you know, what does the current body of literature say about the impacts of climate change on Kansas agriculture? That can be our testable question and we can explore that question through our evaluation of the literature. So we don't always have to be going into a lab or going out into the field or interviewing people. We can create research questions as long as we have some method that we're going out to gather evidence about those questions. So our goal as scientists then, um, we've all heard the, the phrase, you know, if a tree falls in the forest, no one's there to hear it, does it make a noise, that sort of thing. Um, well, my version of that is, if we never publish or communicate our science, did science ever really happen? I don't know. Does it? Somebody says no in the back. Why do you say no? There's no evidence that it ever happened. There's no evidence that it ever happened. Right. That is our whole point of doing science and having and reporting out on science is we've made these observations, we've made conclusions based on those observations, but now it's, it's our responsibility as a scientist to get that information out so other scientists and even consumers can benefit from the science that we've done. So I've mentioned two groups there. I mentioned scientists and I've mentioned consumers. And so really the difference between those two um, is, is a very important one. And it's really what distinguishes between the idea of what I mentioned, the scientific communications and the science communications. And so the scientific communications is when we are communicating amongst ourselves, when we are communicating to peer scientists about the science that we've done, and when we're within our, our field or our discipline of study. And it could be in various shapes and forms. It could be the, through a published research paper like you're reading now and you're using as the basis for your annotated bibliography. It could be through research conference presentations that you do at different disciplines or the presentations that you may be doing in this class or in other classes. It could be through the posters that you mentioned that you have coming up at the end of the semester that should be based off of the work that you're doing. Um, so there's different forms, but the point being is that when we communicate to scientists, um, they are more focused on the science itself and they're also interested in the outcomes or the results of our science and the conclusions of what we came with from our scientific papers or our scientific work. So it's important, the, the point being on this slide here is that so when we're communicating to scientists or when we're communicating about our science within our disciplines in a scientific setting, um, we're wanting to make sure that we include a good component of the background of the science, and I'll get more into a structure for doing this, because they're wanting to know how did we derive at the problem? What is the problem that we're trying to address or the question that we're trying to answer through our science. The supporting details piece in the middle is they do want to know why we're answering that question or why we're addressing that question. They want to know how we're going to address that question. But then also they want to know, oops, I had a little bad word wrap there, um, results and conclusions. They want to know what we found from a data standpoint, but then also what is our interpretation of those results as scientists? What does that mean with regard to our initial question? But when we think about the other side of the coin, when we think about the consumers, meaning those outside of our scientific community, um, they're really focusing on what's the bottom line? What really came out of your science? Why in the so what question of why is that important? I'm not necessarily, as a consumer, I'm not necessarily concerned with how they went about the methods and the data collection process for understanding the impact of climate change on Kansas agriculture if I'm a Kansas farmer. I'm really concerned about what does the results of that research mean to me as a Kansas farmer? Does it mean that I'm facing a long-term future of having a changed weather pattern? more extreme changes, increased drought, you know, hotter and colder. What does it mean to me and how is that going to affect 
my job as a farmer, my livelihood as being an agricultural producer in the state of Kansas. So they're not as concerned about, well, did you use you know, a P of 0.05 or a P of 0.1 when you did your statistical analysis of your trend data that you gathered. Farmers aren't gonna worry about that. That's what the scientists, when you're communicating those results to the scientific audience, those are the types of things that they're gonna look at. You know, did you collect data from multiple sites in the state or did you only collect them from one site? Did you, you know, collect them every hour? Or did you collect them every day? Did you, you know, do a linear regression? Or, you know, those are the types of things that scientists are, are also interested in, in addition to your results and conclusions. Whereas the consumers are focused on the, or the, as we call it, the, the mainstream population or the general population. They're interested in the what did you find and the so what part. How is that going to impact me in my life, in my job, in my you know, children's lives? Is it going to mean that my children will no longer be able to farm in Kansas because we're turning into a desert? Or you know, my children are gonna to have to learn to build igloos because they're gonna have extreme winters. You know, those are the types of things that they're, the, the consumers are going to think about and worry about. So for today though, we're gonna focus on this idea of how we communicate as a scientist and how do we communicate to scientists. Um, so there's this, there's this method out there and you're probably finding this and this looks really familiar if you're reading those research papers and you're going into it in that oftentimes research papers and research reports follow what we call the MRAD format. Actually, I'm going to change this a little bit. The MRAD format. It's, they put an A in there just to make it a normal word that we can say, but the A really just stands for AND. So we have the introduction. We have the methods or methods and, oops, methods and methods. It should be methods and materials. Um, results and the discussion component of this. So really what we're doing is we're reporting kind of in a chronological basis um, or more along the, the scientific method basis of how we've done our research, how we've done our project or our investigation. So we start out our report or we start out our, our paper from the standpoint of here's our introduction, here's a background of the problem, here are the trends or here's the main themes that show up in this, this body of literature that we've been reviewing, which is what you're working on now for your annotated bibliographies. Um, it provides a background for the question that we're answering or a ba background or basis for why we're trying to answer the question that we're trying to answer. And then really at the, the introduction also then presents to the readers, this is the question that we've been trying to solve in this research project. This is our overall objective that we want to do in this project. We want to quantify the extent to which climate change will impact agriculture in Kansas. I mean, that's the, you know, that's our focus of our project. So with that question or that, that overall goal in mind, then we move into saying, okay, so based on that, that overall problem, how are we gonna go about solving this? How are we gonna go about collecting information that will allow us to quantify the extent that which climate change is impacting Kansas agriculture? So are we going to go out and put out weather stations around the state of Kansas and collect data for the next 20 years and then come back and analyze it? Are we going to go back into the data that's already been collected and analyze that? Are we going to go out and interview farmers that have been farming in the state of Kansas for at least 20 years and, and get their trend data of how they've seen the climate change and how they've seen climate impact their view or their roles in agriculture over the last 20 years? So the methods are really, what is it that we're going to do, maybe not necessarily to solve the problem, but what is it that we're going to do to gather information that will allow us to go back and address that initial objective. So think of it kind of, um, the methods part is kind of like the recipe card. It's telling us what we're going to be doing, and it tells us how we're going to be doing it. So we're going to gather the ingredients and we're going to mix them in a particular order. We're going to form them in a particular shape and we're going to you know, bake them or freeze them or chill them or do whatever. So the methods tells us what we're going to do and what this should have said was and materials. The materials are going to tell us what we're going to use to do that. Um, in social science research, we don't have as much from a material standpoint. 
uh, more in like natural and physical sciences, you know, it's I'm going to be using this piece of equipment or we're going to be doing, you know, using these types of reagents or we're going to be collecting these types of uh, specimens or samples or whatnot. So that's the kind of materials piece that we're going to do. The methods are the instructions on the recipe, the materials are the ingredients on the recipe card. Then we go to the results. The results are very much the objective data that we collect from implementing the methods that we've talked about. So once we've gone out and collected our data, um, the data is the numbers, it's the facts, it's the transcripts of the interviews from working with the farmers, it's the you know, relative humidity and the temperature and the rainfall and the wind speed and all of those things that come from the, the weather meters, et cetera. It's just that raw information that we've come together, that's been brought together. So it's the outcomes of doing the recipe. So it would be basically, you know, the baked cookies that come out of the oven or the loaf of bread or, or whatever that we're using that we're baking or creating the recipe. The discussion then is really the part where you, as scientists, then provide the value. This is the part where you take the data that you've collected and you make meaning of it. You interpret the data. You see that, okay, so over the last 20 years, the average winter temperature has increased 3.7 degrees in the state of Kansas. That's the data. The data says that the average temperature has increased 3.7 degrees. You're the person then in this discussions section that says, so what? What does that mean? Is it important? Is it significant? Is it insignificant? Is it just part of the you know, cycle of weather in Kansas? Is it something that's going to continue to increase and cause complete devastation? You know, those are the types of things that you have to do from an interpretation standpoint. You do those interpretation pieces based on your analysis of the data. So if you run statistics and it comes out with, you know, uh, the mean values and your standard deviations, what do those types of things mean? But also then where you come into play in this discussion section is you provide meaning of those results with respect to the bigger body of knowledge. So in your study, it showed that the average temperature has increased 3.7 degrees. Well, what does the body of literature say? What are other studies saying that are from California or Texas, or maybe this was replicated in the 20 years before the data that you collected? What was happening in those 20 years? Maybe they showed that it was going out. So you're putting some context and some meaning to that data through your interpretation of the scientists. It's where you provide the most value in this whole process in the write-up, but it's also probably the hardest part to be able to develop and put together because you've got to think about the bigger context of the body of knowledge that's out there, which is what you wrote about in the introduction piece. And the, probably the, my soapbox that I, I talk to with students all the time. In this section, while season finales and cliffhangers are awesome in television and movies going into sequels, we don't want that in your report. When you set up your introduction that we're going to characterize the impact of climate change on agriculture in the state of Kansas, and people are, ooh, this is going to be a really good paper. I'm excited about this. It's a topic that I want to study. My family's been farmers in Kansas for decades and generations. I can't wait to see the results of this. They get into the methods like, ooh, those are really good methods. I never thought about collecting data that way. They get into the results and say, oh, wow, they've got some awesome data. And then you get in here like, huh, so what happened? Has climate change impacted agriculture in Kansas or not? Tune in for the next paper? No, that, <laughs> that's not what we want. We want to tie our discussion back into our question and our position that we presented in our introduction. If we set out in this paper or if we set out in this experiment or this project to try to find out X, when we get to the end of the paper, we pretty much need to tell the people that are reading the paper, did we or did we not find out X? If we did, great, what does that mean? If we didn't, why not? What are our assumptions? Why do we think that we didn't come up with some form of an answer to our question at the beginning? So no cliffhangers, okay? We don't wanna wait around for the next report or the next published paper. We wanna know 
what happened in this project. And then we want to move on. And this is where we say, you know, in academics, we say, oh, we create more questions than we do answers. Well, because we may have found out something here from that study, which gives us some indication of, well, maybe we need to go back and use 40 years worth of data, not 20 years, because maybe it wasn't long enough. Maybe we need to have more weather stations included in our analysis. Uh, maybe we need to use a different statistical method to analyze the data because the one we used um, wasn't robust enough to address the types of data that we had, those sorts of things. So we can, we can present ways that we can change this and improve upon our answers um, for future studies, but we at least need to conclude this project in this paper, okay? So that's, that's the big thing when you come to this last section, this discussion. And even the implications piece. Um, what does this research mean for your discipline? If you're in environmental ecology, what does this research mean to the field of environmental ecology? If you're in agronomy, what does this research mean to the field of agronomy? What is this, what do the outcomes of your project or the outcomes of your research mean with relation to the body of knowledge that's out there on climate change and agriculture? What does it mean for the body of knowledge that's on, you know, mutations of animals because of climate change? Whatever that field is or whatever that kind of, that body of knowledge field is, position your study with respect to that field. How does it contribute to it? Does it support other conclusions of other papers? Does it contradict? findings in other papers, and then maybe explain why. You probably ought to have at least an idea of, well, you know, all of those other papers out there saw that there hasn't been any climate impact in agriculture, but ours showed that there has been an impact in agriculture. Maybe because we, everybody else is looking at it from an economic perspective, and we looked at it from a production and yield perspective, or they looked at it from a production and yield perspective, we looked at it from a soil quality perspective and how has the quality of soil changed because of the change in climate? You know, maybe the soils are better now, but that's because we've had drought and lower rainfall, so there's been less runoff to create leaching and reduction of biomass in soils, and, you know, and everybody else was just purely looking at it of whoop, temperatures and yields, okay? So those are the types of things that position yours with regard to the other things that are out there. So this is kind of a one format or one structure of putting together a, a research report of providing the introduction, providing some background to the problem, bringing in the, the synthesis piece of the literature. Um, what you're doing now, the annotated bibliography is great because it's a, it's a summary of the literature in terms of it's a summary of paper one and a summary of paper two and a summary of paper three and four and five. Just don't copy and paste that into your report. What I want you to do from a scientist perspective is right now you've described the trees. You said here's an oak and there's a maple and there's a sugar maple and there's that. Okay, now what the next step is for this introduction piece is to step back and say, okay, so what does the forest look like? How does these three trees over here that are saying this or these three papers all saying this, how do they relate to the papers over here that are saying this? So now you're going to start doing the whole synthesis piece of the literature, of bringing things together and talking about trends or themes in use of research methods, trends and themes in the focus of the research questions or objectives that are being studied in the papers. How, what are the trends and the types of outcomes or the conclusions that are being drawn in the research that's out there? That gets, that's the harder piece of it, because then you've got to really get into and understand the literature and the papers that you're reading, and really get to know them on a sort of a one-to-one -one basis. I mean, you're going beyond the Facebook friend status with those papers, okay? You're actually making personal friends with those papers and getting to know what is it that they said about this? What is it, what are their pitfalls from that one? What was their conclusions in this one? How did the conclusions in that one compared to other papers that you've read. That's where we're going we're to bring in, hopefully, when you move on beyond the annotated bibliography stage of, now you're just describing the individual papers, which is a great start because it's starting to get you thinking about those papers and looking at, well, what did they find in this paper? What were they even studying in this paper? And 
how do they go about studying it, et cetera. But now we're going to start stepping back and kind of doing that 30 foot or 30,000 foot view of the literature and looking at the entire literature landscape. It's not to say you have to look at the entire literature that's out there, you know, like everything in the library, you go learn it. But you're going to, through your question development and your objective development that you're working on in your projects, that's going to give you some parameters of how to go about studying that literature, which then establishes this background piece and this introduction piece, but then also gives you a context in which you can orient your conclusions that come out of your paper. Okay? So the synthesis. You're in the summary stage, but you provide value through the synthesis component, and that's what really helps you orient your project or your objective and your goals is when you can provide that synthesis of the, the literature field that's out there. So as you're working on these papers, as you're working on these projects, how do we, how do we focus our projects? How do we focus our reports? What do we focus on when we're, we're getting into this writing standpoint? Scientific writing is objective writing. And pretty much there's about mm, one place in your paper that you can really bring in opinion. And it's not really much opinion as it is interpretation. Um, part of you comes into play through the synthesis of the literature and the introduction. Um, but then part of you comes back into play in this project in terms of those conclusions and that discussion at the end, because that's where you're drawing an interpretation of the information. The data is factual. It is what it is. You know, the average or the mean is 3.7, or the mean change is 9.5, or you know, the standard deviation is you know, plus or minus 0.23. That's the data. That's, that's not going to change. What's going to change is, is, or could change, is your interpretation of the data. Um, and as I often tell my students, too, doing research, whether if it's a literature review paper, or doing an experiment in a lab, or a field project, or conducting surveys with farmers and ranchers, or whatever, really all it is, it's a series of justifiable decisions. When you start at the beginning and figure out you have a question or an objective, why do you have that objective? Well, that objective is based on, and you can justify that objective based on what you've read and how you've synthesized what's in the pool of literature, right? You don't just say, well, I'm going to study this. I think it'd be really cool. Or I've heard that people don't have any, haven't, have, haven't been impacted by climate change, so I'm going to go out and study it. Well, that's a good place to start, but you probably need to go out and look in the literature because there may be 37 papers already published that are focusing on climate change's impact in agriculture. So what is it from that literature, what is it from that gap of information or that change in the knowledge pool that supports the reason why you have the focus that you do in your project? Okay. Or the methods. Why is it that you're doing surveys with farmers as opposed to going out and collecting data or using historical data from, from uh, weather sensors and weather meters? What was it that brought you to the conclusion of using that method? What was it in the literature that said, you know, we've, you know, is it, is it because you're looking at it from a, a social, cultural perspective, anthropological perspective? as opposed to an ecological perspective or an agricultural perspective. That's why you're getting the, the farmer perspective or farmer perception on the change or the impacts of climate in agriculture. So, what, so when the method that you use is justified by what you find in the literature. Why, and if you're doing the, the anthropological sort of study, why are you doing in-depth interviews with farmers as opposed to bringing them together and having a discussion in more of a focus group type setting? Or why are you going to the farms and doing the interviews in person versus doing the interviews via telephone? All of those decisions are based on things that you find that are published in the literature, whether if it's in the books on methodology or if it's in the research literature that's on the basis for those, those topics of study. So just think about it of when you make a decision, what's your reason for making that decision the way you made that decision? And that's where we need to have some, some substantiation behind those decision making. And then at the end, let's think about what is the contribution, I've talked about this a little bit already, what's the contribution of our study or our work to the body of knowledge. So is it, like I said, is it supporting 
of the research that's already out there? Is it contradicting other research that's out there? Is it bringing in a new way of analyzing data because we've brought on some new methodology that wasn't available five years ago or wasn't, wasn't developed five years ago when all these other studies were done? So how does our piece contribute into that? And how does it contribute to the field or the discipline? So those that are in agriculture, those that are in climate change, those that are in environmental ecology and out there working or, or conservation district managers, what's going to be kind of that so what question of how is our research, specifically in this project, how is this science going to help them and contribute to them? So when we think about our papers, when we think about our presentations, what is our audience? Are we talking more to a science community as a scientist? Are we talking more to a consumer audience as a scientist? And so that initial thought when we're trying to decide how do we structure our papers, how do we develop our presentations, what is it, what does that, our audience, mean to how we're going to do this? And my understanding is a lot of your projects and your reports and things are more, more on the scientific basis to scientists as opposed to you as scientists communicating to the consumer, the general public, the masses. Hence the topic for today's presentation of how do we make papers and presentations scientific. We focus on the details of the justification of the problem through the literature in our introduction. We explain the methods so they understand how we went about collecting the data. Um, one rule of thumb in writing a research paper, and I know you may not take this to the point of a fully publishable journal article that you would submit to, to a journal, but a rule of thumb on the methods section is that it should be detailed enough that a competent scientist could reproduce your research. And we use the term competent scientist in there because you're not going to necessarily spell out all of the methods. So say there's some big analytical method for conducting some chemical assay. You know, it's known as the Jones technique. Well, in your, you know, if it's commonly accepted in your field, you can just reference that we use the Jones technique and then cite the source in your paper to analyze these samples. Well, a competent scientist would know enough to be able to either already know the Jones technique or be able to use your citation to go find the Jones technique and then be able to do it, to implement the Jones technique. Now if you did some, some modifications to the Jones technique, you can say, we use the Jones technique, but in steps three and five, we made these changes to the process because you know, we had frozen samples and not fresh samples or whatever the, the reasoning is for why you change that method. So that's why we talk about your method should be detailed enough that a competent scientist could do it. So it's not every paper that's out there that uses the Jones technique includes, you know, 2,000 words to explain the Jones technique. They can just cite to the original Jones paper and, and be done with it. So that's why, so, so the scientists want the introduction. They want that methods piece so they understand how you went about doing it. And the importance of that whole justifiable decision making is that they may not agree with the way you did things, but through your presentation and through your writing, as long as you justify the reason why you did that, they should at least be able to respect the decision. Like, you know, I wouldn't have done it that way. I would have used the Smith method, not the Jones method, but I can see why they used it in this, this situation. So then they can at least follow through and follow the rest of your paper because they want to see how you came to that endpoint. They like to they like the transparency of the whole process. Now, when you give your presentations, um, if you have ten minutes, don't spend nine of your ten minutes talking about the introduction and your methods. You do also want to provide time to discuss the outcomes and the conclusions of your paper. Um, who's been to a research presentation, research conference before? Anybody? Who's had that where the person in the back holds up the two minute warning sign and the person up front sees and goes, oh no, and they fast forward through about 17 of their slides to get to the one that says conclusion. So they skipped all the data tables and they went straight to the one that's like, oh, okay, here's what we found out. Here's why it's really important. So you, you want to give everything its, it's just time and it's, it's, it's just attention. You can do more of that in the paper 
than you can in the presentation. The, you know, you want to give them enough in your presentation so they understand how you went about doing things, but it doesn't have to be in as much detail like on the methods and things um, as you would necessarily be in a, in a research paper that you're presenting. So give them some context through introduction, give them an understanding of the methods. We're talking about presentations now. An understanding of the methods, they at least know that you use data from weather machines versus interviewing farmers. And then go into the data of here's what we found and then importantly the conclusions that come out of it. So all the pieces are important for the scientists, for the science presentations. The conclusions and the implications piece is the most important part when you're talking to a non-scientific audience. So I've got some time. I'm going to leave it for questions and things. I know hopefully I've conjured up some thoughts of, okay, so we have this assignment coming up. And I found these papers. How might I address this, or what should I go about doing? So I'll stop there, and I'll open it up for questions. And even if you don't have questions, you're not getting out 10 minutes early. Because <laughs> I'm sure he's got things to talk about. But questions or thoughts? I kind of have a question for Bill Kemp and Professor Andrew. Sure. So we're doing a community project. Okay. So it's kind of, I don't know if you're planning on doing two different like posters, one to like for the layman's and then one for scientists. But like the community people are the ones that are like dealing with this project once it's done. Okay. So like, how could we make it so everyone could understand? Or is that just like completely out of the question? Does that make sense? Do we need two posters or one? Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's why I well, that's, I'll, I'll pass that to the yeah. intent of the poster, and then we can go from there. Yeah. Well, may, maybe I would say that uh, the written product due at the end of the semester mm -hmm. for which you will be evaluated, as well as the poster, we're assuming you're writing that for a scientific okay. audience. Now, you could have, as part of your overall objectives within your group, to also produce a fact sheet or something that you could distribute. But for the class itself and your assessment, it's the scientific writing component that will be evaluated. Even if you have more of a service project, sometimes in this class we have groups that do more of a service project. Still, we want that service to be done more in this scientific context and get you practicing the scientific sense of this robot thing that we're looking at different ways of implementing kind of design strategies that's using the results of science. You know, so I'm kind of puzzling over there's a difference between designs and science, and that science there's one answer that comes out. There's multiple ways of doing designs based on science. But we get different kinds of cars and get different kinds of farm machinery that are applying science. And you know, that you still follow the same kind of a process, but it's intellectually a little bit different. And I think if I understand your comment correctly, I mean, you're kind of getting at maybe the difference between basic science and applied science yeah. to a certain degree. You know, it's sort of like the architects, you know, a great many are very much of, they were more on the art side of artfully applying, you know, physical structures. It still has lots of heavy duty science in it, yeah. materials, etc. So, um, but I think even the architects would argue that there's some science behind there from an aesthetic, you know, the, the balance of the two-fifths and three-fifths rules and some of those core concepts. So, so I think I'd, if understanding your project, you're calling more upon the findings of the research to inform the implementation of these strategies from a water, from a basin, yeah. And that still comes to the point of you're making objective decisions of, should we design it this way or should we design it that way? What is, you know, is it, is it flatlands or is it hilly? Is it, you know, mostly grass or is there a lot of concrete? Or, you know, I, I'm not into the, yeah, that, that, the, that field, but, idea, but see, those are the types of decisions that you're making 
And then so based on those criteria of the situation, you're going to make a recommendation one way versus the other, or you're going to design something in one way possibly versus the other based on what comes out of that. And so that's then going to go back into some of the research that says, so we've done experiments in situations that are at certain degree slopes versus ones that are other slopes, and we found that on the flatter ones you can use these types of plant media to slow it down as opposed to the ones that are steeper and you have quicker runoff, you need to do some sort of a soil intervention as opposed, in addition to a plant intervention to reduce runoff and erosion or you know, whatever the, the point being. So you're still going to go back to hopefully what's been done and what's been studied as a basis for your recommendations. As We just like the look of cottonwood, so let's put a bunch of them out there. Um, you know, yeah, so you're going to call upon that in its application. The, where the, the real science you get into then is are you going to go to the point of testing those recommendations? May not, because those recommendations should be based on the science. That's where a lot of extension publications and extension programming comes out is we're recommending in, in cooperative extension, we're recommending practices and behaviors or use of a certain equipment based on what the research says is best for those particular situations. So, you know, use this hybrid here because you have that kind of soil type because we've tested hybrids on those soil types and this is the one that's going to work best for your soil type. So, so yeah, you're, you may not necessarily get to the conclusions of where you're actually testing a, a question, but you're calling in the literature, you're calling in the science to inform the decisions that you're making from a recommendation standpoint. So it's kind of more of a program planning and extension model as opposed to a, a pure question and testing of a research model. Yeah, I'm getting just that mix between art and science. And science. There's a method behind the madness, yeah. <laughs> you know, my, part of my area is in food safety and there's a reason why we cook foods to certain temperatures, not just because we want it to be done, but those temperatures kill bacteria. So we cook to those temperatures because of the science behind us. We're not just recommending because we don't want to eat raw meat. Well, we can eat raw meat from a nutritional standpoint, but from a health standpoint, you got to cook it there to, to kill any potential bacterial contamination or store in shallow flat pans because heat transfer says when you have a greater surface area and thinner mass, then the, the temperature will drop quicker because the heat can escape, which heat is important to get chilled so bacterial contamination won't grow. So there's the science behind the recommendations. That's yeah, yeah, but, which is kind of along the lines like the service projects and stuff too. We may structure service projects in a certain way, not just because that's the way we want to do it, because, but because more of social science literature says that we can provide a greater sense of being and belonging in a community when people are involved in contributing to the community, sort of thing. And so that's why we can structure programs in a way that it's not just a one and done, oh hey, come out and pick up trash and you're done. Well, that doesn't instill a sense of community and really help the community other than short term, it cleans up the roadsides type of thing. So, other questions? All right, I'll ask a question, sure. Jason. So you've probably read a number of papers, both uh, in your role as a researcher as well as an educator, uh, perhaps served on editorial boards for journals that we yeah. contributed in that way. What's the weakest part in general of scientific writing, kind of from the in-red uh, um, that you described? The, what are we worst at? The ends. Um, one is, okay, if we're starting at the bottom, like the top three, you know, the third runner-up, um, probably the, the second runner-up would be the introduction of, of clearly using the literature to describe why, why are we doing what it is that we're doing? Um, what's the justification? What's the rationale behind it? So why not, it, a lot of times when I read papers and things, it just sounds like, well, you're just doing this because you thought it was cool and you wanted to do it, which is okay if you have this question that you want to investigate, but what's the, what's the reasoning behind how you're doing the things and why you're structuring the question the way you are? So that's like number two. That's the you know miscongeniality of the pageant here. So the, the the winner, I think, is that that discussions piece of clearly going back and answering the question and tying your results and providing meaning to those results. So when you if you do an experiment or if you do a more of a research project, so this is what we did, 
great, this is what we found out, but what's, what's the significance of that? What's that so what question? And, and how does that go back and, and relate to you accomplishing your initial objective? So if your initial objective was to improve the community through um, sustained community involvement, great. How has that, or after you've done the project that you've done, how has that gone back and addressed that initial objective that you had? Not just, well, okay, so we had you know, 17 people come out one day and help pick up trash in the park. That's your data, that's the outputs of your project, but what's the outcomes? How did that 17 people coming out and helping pick up trash help improve the community? or help improve people's sense of place in the community or whatever you set out to do as a result of doing that community service project or that, that service project as a whole. So that's the, that's the important part, not just reporting the outputs. And we talk about this in extension and logic models in our grants and those things is, we don't wanna just know how many, you know, cheeks in the seats did you have at your workshops. Who cares if you had 500 people show up at three workshops, big deal. Did any of those 500 people do anything as a result of attending your workshop? Or have they maintained, you know, did they increase their productivity as a farmer? Or did they reduce their, their, their costs as a homeowner because they came to your, your weatherization workshop? Those are the things that are important. What's, what's happened as a result of what you've, what you've done? So start thinking in those of not, not thinking about the features, but what's the benefits that's come out of it. You know, your cell phone has a camera. That's a feature. What's the benefit to you? You know, that when you're out in the field, you can capture unique new plants and insects, or, you know, you need to have your mom pick up something at the grocery store so you can text her a picture of what you really need so she doesn't come home with the wrong thing. That's the benefit of having a camera on your phone. Okay? So think about the benefits of what you're doing, not just what you're doing. Now I'm over time. Okay. Well, let's thank Dr. Ellis for his presentation.